We're going to actually start with a little bit of a panel. Uh, it's going to be moderated by Jeff Thorpe, who's the director of IoT security at NXP. And uh, this is, uh, I saw Jeff a couple of weeks ago at Lenaro Connect. It was the first time I met him, actually. And uh, he had some really interesting stuff to say about security uh, in general and uh, in the Zephyr project. And so uh, I think you'll find this a very interesting discussion. So I think we're going to start off with a video, and then the panel will get going after that. So let's go ahead and uh, do that. Security is a big challenge for the Internet of Things. You can't avoid it. We're talking about people's homes, security cameras, and health information, and infrastructure like roads and buildings. If people don't trust that they're secure, they won't deploy IoT devices. And that's why the Zephyr Project is an RTOS designed with security in mind for small footprint IoT devices. Mere cryptography isn't enough anymore. So that's why Zephyr goes further. At its very foundation, Zephyr runs on single executable binaries, meaning every feature is compiled up front. Throughout the project's development, every component goes through a rigorous life cycle to check the security of the feature. Once a feature is added to the project, it's reviewed for security and compiled into the static binary. This doesn't stop bad code from existing. It's a fact of life in software development. So the Zephyr project is designed around tools and processes to minimize the risk of insecure code being included. A community of project members reviews every feature to make sure that sound security practices are applied as code is implemented into the Zephyr project. And features that relate to security get extra scrutiny through our security risk assessment. Regular code reviews ensure compliance, functionality, readability, and maintainability. Static code analysis finds complex and significant functional and security defects. And survivability ensures that security vulnerabilities that happen upstream from Zephyr are addressed and disclosed appropriately. The result? When you incorporate Zephyr security updates, your edge devices become more functional and more securable. And we're just getting started. We have several groundbreaking features in mind, and we're looking for thought leaders to help build them out and add more. IoT is the future, and Zephyr is the future of IoT. You can help make the future of IoT more secure by downloading the code and contributing. Join us by visiting zephyrproject.org today. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? yeah. Um, uh, thanks very much for coming along. And uh, I know we're all that stands between you and the prizes, so um, you'll f forgive us nonetheless for resi not resisting the temptation to profit from a captive audience. Um, uh, Tim didn't actually give you the whole story. See, uh, what happened was um, Tim and some Linux Foundation people thought it would be cool that I come along and talk about something, and, and, and the Linux Foundation said, you have to come along and talk what, you know, what's hot in everyone's lips, right? I said, well, you know, this Donald Trump thing, it's not really my game. But he said, no, 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 the other thing everyone's talking about. I said, well, Zephyr or IoT security, and they're really all talking about that. And they said, no, but we were just trying to make you feel good. So, um, Nonetheless, thank you for being here. Um, uh, what was scheduled was a talk on IoT security uh, and Zephyr, a subject about which I'm very passionate. But um, we have uh, in town here uh, the technical leaders from, uh, from Zephyr. Uh, and, um, you know, at the booths here and at other conferences, in offline discussions, online discussions, um, you know, there's a bunch of things that keep coming back. And so what we thought it would be good is to, to use this opportunity to, to discuss those here with the relevant people. Um, but the, the IoT thing, the IoT security, I mean, this, this was a marketing message that we used to try and encourage uh, a certain class of people, perhaps, who need to sort of have some grasp of the basic terms to understand what's going on. That's not really you people. Um, I know it's a very technically literate crowd, and um, uh, my concern on IoT security is much the contrary. It's, it's, it's not a positive message. It's really a really much more worried one. Um, the talk, I, I, gave it to, I gave this talk on Tuesday, I think, and so this is gonna, it's online. If you have any interest at all, I really can't recommend too highly to just take a look at it. Um, it really is a kind of call to arms about a number of key things that we think are problematic that are coming. And this is not the typical commercial IoT security apocalypse story that people use to ply their wares. This is, I think, some blind spots that everyone is actually missing right now. Um, and so all the chit chat around IoT security that you do here, I think, in some sense, leads us into a false sense of security, because I think there's a few key points that are being missed. 
So again, if, if you have the, you know, the 50 minutes to lose, please take a look at the talk. It's, um, there's some material in there that we care about. And, and to be clear, uh, we're not trying to say Zephyr has the answer to all these things or that Zephyr is the answer or that we're better than anyone else at this stuff. It's just that there is some stuff there that we want to be part of addressing that needs to be addressed and is not being sufficiently addressed. So that's my 50 minute talks sort of compacted to two minutes so that we can have some, some real coders do some talking. Um, so yeah, we have the, the key most technical leaders here. Um, I'd like to introduce Anas, who's from Intel, and he's uh, basically, he's the chair of the technical steering committee. So he's sort of coordinating the code and coordinating the people working on the code. Uh, we've got my colleague Maureen from NXP, who's top-notch microcontroller security architect for us, and so she's always explaining these things to me. And Lenaro has just joined. Um, they formed a light group, which is, um, well, I'll, I may let Kumar explain, but anyway, Kumar's a, a familiar face to many of you, and um, and so these these three are like I think three of the key people. And before we get into it, um, uh, I, I certainly want to not forget. There's a couple other people that ought to be here. Rude from Synopsis has been engaged with this from the very outset. Uh, unfortunately, had to leave last night, so can't be here. But um, and also Kate, who is here can't be here uh, because um, she's been keeping so many Linux Foundation projects alive for the last two weeks that um, I think she's talked herself out and no longer has a voice. So it's a, sort of a shout out to those who couldn't shout even if they tried. Right. Um, so without further ado, um, uh, the, the, I have some basic questions, but you guys can sort of take this wherever you think it ought to go. So yeah, the, um, there's sort of recurring themes that come up, and I know the key one that keeps coming up is that, you know, there's this caricature, right, about standards, that the good thing about standards is there's so many to choose from, right? The RTOS landscape is a little bit the same. There are so many different RTOSs out there, and uh, everyone and their uncle seems to be building one. And so is the solution to build another one? Um, so I guess that would be like where I'd like to start this off, is why another RTOS? Okay, so... <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Uh, why another Arthos? Obviously, we, when we started looking uh, at the problem that we had at hand, we looked at what's available out there, and we were not able to find anything that would uh, give us something comparable, for example, to Linux, uh, something that w uh, does not have any specific direction or, or distinction uh, and uh, something that would basically drive innovation. Yeah? Uh, we, we didn't find any project that uh, has governance. Uh, there are many reasons out there uh, related to licensing and ownership and innovation again and, 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 and fragmentation, fragmentation within the projects themselves that existed out there. So. The idea was actually to take something. Well, obviously, Zephyr itself is not a project that was started from scratch. It's based on something that already existed. It's just we uh, modified it in a way that would fit the needs for what we think is best for IoT and uh, the plans that we have in terms of security uh, and so on. Cool. Would you like to pile onto that, or has he got it? Sure. So I think, you know, from the Lenaro viewpoint, one of the things that's always important to us is having an upstream and having a vibrant community around that upstream. So Linux, Linux kernel development is a very vibrant, natural community. Um, and when you look at a lot of the RTOSs out there, part of the governance uh, involved with Zephyr, both from the members that are there, so that there's a balance between membership as well as involving the community um, and seeing that community grow in the last, I don't know, four or five months that I've been involved with the project uh, and, and trying to see that similar open source activity, contribu contribution from uh, developers, whether that be from member companies or other companies uh, or other individuals that have projects that they're working on and, and have an interest in. So I think that's another reason that, you know, when you look at a lot of these RTOSs that are out there, trying to get one that really has a vibrant community was one of the reasons we thought that Zephyr was worth uh, participating in. So I think for those of you that have come by the booth or checked out the code, you've, you've probably heard us talk about and have seen the fact that, you know, Zephyr, Zephyr is cross architectures, right? Um, you know, we, we, we talk about Intel, we talk about NXP and ARM, 
um, and synopsis. But I, I think the other thing that, that's special about Zephyr is, is it's not just the instruction set architecture, um, but that you know this philosophy of, of you know having interfaces that are common across different hardware platforms. And so you know we extend that to you know the device driver model, for example. Um, that doesn't isn't always the case um, in the microcontroller world and in, in other RTOSs out um, there that you could take a look at. So um, you know, I, I think it makes things much easier for um, somebody that's developing middleware or higher level drivers or applications that they have a common interface that they can write to um, that they can be used across multiple platforms. I'm going to put you on the spot um, with respect to the multi-architecture point. We have um, this has kind of come up in other guys. You know, this question's come up in other forms, but perhaps not in this form, is that um, we have Intel, we have ARM ecosystem members. Um, we want to have lots of other people coming in, but right now it's, it's primarily, you know, the critical mass is three architectures in terms of involvement. How have you found working with the enemy? So, so I guess I've been working with the enemy in one shape or another and, and different enemies if you, if you look at it that way uh, for most of my career with open source and, and it's one of the things I love about working on an open source projects is you know I can be working with a competitor from my business uh, the company I may work for uh, or you know be representing and we can still work and collaborate on problems that honestly aren't value add to those companies right it is that sense of you know, work that we all have to do or all have to solve and doing it together always produces a better solution uh, than doing it separately. So, I, you know, I think what I've seen since, you know, we, we started this project and launched this project back in February, um, that, you know, the other members have, have really practiced what they preach in terms of, um, you know, the, we, we saw Intel initially developing on our NXP board. Um, they didn't stop. They, co they continued to do that. They continued to build upon that and, and give us feedback. And, and we've seen that happening across multiple members and um, you know, other contributors in the community. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about enemies here. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's the right analogy here, but uh, if we take it this far, I think uh, one of the things, we, we, we are learning a lot from our enemies in this project, yeah? Uh, and that's, that's something that actually adds a lot of value to the project because it, when you are forced to think, uh, when, when you are obstructing uh, software interfaces, ABIs, or when you are implementing software ABIs, you have to start think differently when you have to support other architectures. And that makes your ABIs much more better. They are not specific to your architecture. They are not specific to your hardware. And that's, of course, I mean, if you look at it from an end user perspective, this is what users expect. I want a user of Intel hardware to be able to, to, to switch and, and, and test their hardware on other platforms if, if need be. Or I want also, of course, customers of my enemies to come to, to, to use my hardware. Yeah. No chance. W without without changing any 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 software, so that's that's actually very beneficial, and it it improves the uh, the software tremendously, I think. Cool. Um, so, with respect to the uh, the community, I mean, we started out as a very small group of large companies, um, and we're having, you know, all sorts of people show up, you know, a little unexpectedly sometimes. Uh, showing interest. Um, but I mean, ultimately, I know that the interest for me, and I, I believe many people are, who I represent, was that this, this would attempt to try and create the circumstances that are uh, fertile for the, the open source community to kick in. We're all kind of jealous of what, you know, the various Linux um, well, kernel and, and, and other tools uh, enjoy in terms of the sort of the, the self-driving dynamic of an open source movement. Um, what could be done, or what could be done better uh, to, to work on that, to encourage that kind of uh, dynamic, that kind of open source community? We could come out here and talk to you guys. 
no, and I think that it, I think some of it is socialization, so getting more people just aware of the project, whether that's you know at conferences like this and, and others. I think having you know some more developer-oriented uh, action, so we can you know get hacking together on code. Um, and then I think there's just you know things that as the as the project grows, we learn sort of the pain points or realize as we talk to people who do come and and contribute. Like, what were their barriers? You know, was it easy to find information about how to do a board port, or you know, maybe it's documentation, maybe it's you know things on like the wiki and having to do items or just different things to get people engaged and, and learning from them on you know what their issues were and how do we remove them so it is easier for people to contribute. Yeah, the, the engagement with the community and even with our partners uh, in the project actually had taught us a lot, yeah, because when, when, you, when you put something as an open source project, obviously you, you come from a, a certain culture and you have a certain ways of doing things. And when you go open source, when we went open source for the project, a lot of people have different expectations on something like, like Zephyr in this case, especially when we, uh, other, other vendors that might be interested in joining the project, but especially the community. And the community, I mean, over the last few weeks, we are learning a lot. When people try to use Zephyr, when, when they go have the first experience with Zephyr, I, I, I'm always glad to see them come back to mailing lists or IRC or whatever social channels we have there and, and report. And I always go and ask them, yeah, why, I mean, how can I help? What was wrong? What didn't you like? Yeah, and sometimes I get these answers and my, my job uh, 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 in this project actually to, to, to listen and, and try to direct whatever comes from the community into actual and uh, actionable items uh, uh, within the project itself. So the community itself is actually uh, helping us uh, move the, the project into the right direction. Yeah? And uh, I think this is uh, going also to help uh, uh, other users and help uh, 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 the project itself uh, uh, move to where we want to go in terms of security and, and other features that we are working on. Okay. So I think one of the common questions I got over the last couple of days was, you know, do you support this? Do you do support that? And, you know, I, I think that the fact that, you know, we're, we're really striving to be an open source project. And so, you know, if something isn't there or if there's a feature that you're interested, go scratch your itch. Um, you know, we, we really are welcoming and encouraging new patches to be submitted. So, you know, it's not a static thing. It's, it's something that grows with time. Cool. Um, if I may, uh, I mean, we all work on lots of different stuff, but if I could have, like, make maybe a show of hands for people who would say that there are more Linux developers than, say, Atos developers. Right. Okay, that's what I suspected. Um, I mean, uh, with respect to the security angle, I won't rehash my, uh, my other talk, but I mean, the key concern I have there is that there is a difference in culture of security around device security and network security or, or logical security. I mean, they, uh, there's a static versus dynamic. Um, there's all sorts of diff ways those, those areas of computing are very different. Uh, and IoT and microcontrollers are being dragged kicking and screaming into the ne networked world as part of IoT. So, that is a necessary and difficult um, adjustment. But I guess with so many Linux hackers here, um, what would you guys say would be, uh, if, if someone's trying to work perhaps for the first time, or for the first time in, in a long time, on something that's microcontroller based, um, coming where, from where they come from, what are they going to, what should they expect? What are they gonna hit, say with Zephyr? So, I mean, I, I came from that world, so I, you know, been kernel hacking for 10, 15 years, I don't remember when I started um, on PowerPC and, and coming into Zephyr. And so it was one of the nice things about Zephyr is since it utilizes the kernel kconfig and build system, that was our, it just had a natural feel just to get it going with it. So that was kind of, you know, an easy transition in that respect. And then it's just kind of going through the code and looking at it and, you know, it has a, a at least that feel or similarities in some respects to kind of Linux and so forth. So that was an easy transition for me um, to, to make. So I think on the other side of that, I don't come from a Linux hacker background. I come from a microcontroller background. And so, um, you know, a lot of our customers and a lot of the people that we work with 
um, similarly. And so, you know, it's it, it's it's not unusual to see um, you know microcontroller applications that are developed on Windows. Um, you know, these different proprietary tool chains. Um, and, and, and really, another big important thing is, you know, we're, we're very resource constrained in terms of memory, in terms of performance. And so I think, um, you know, coming down from, a, a, you know, the Linux world into the microcontroller world, you, you'll see things in Zephyr where, you know, we put a huge emphasis on, on code size um, and keeping things optimal so it can fit into some of these small microcontrollers. Yeah, I'm also coming from Linux, and uh, I mean the exciting thing about uh, about Zephyr is uh, you when you're trying to address the MCU uh, space, uh, you you have the numbers. Basically, it fits. When you try to do that with Linux, and we have been trying actually to squeeze Linux to fit in in MCU class uh, uh, devices, and that's that's a journey that I mean a lot of people have to go through depending on what they are trying to do, and usually it, it, it ends you know, without any success there, especially if you are trying to target 8K of devices. Obviously, Linux will not run there, yeah, uh, or run. Uh, from a, you know, in, in, in Zephyr, compared with Linux, you are basically the kernel, you are the middleware, you are the application. And you, you are not just building a kernel like in Linux, you actually, building more than that, and you have to, as, as a provider or as a software developer yeah, in Zephyr, you have to worry about all the aspects, going all the way from the, 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 the scheduler to, 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 to networking to uh, middleware, and basically to, to the final uh, application and ha how you interact with the user. So it is actually much more challenging uh, than uh, what a Linux kernel developer would be doing on, on a daily basis. So uh, the scope is actually more than just kernel. Uh, it, 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 it gives you also an exposure into uh, the world of uh, uh, use case and use cases and how to design the OS in a way that fits in, into different use cases in terms of uh, security, connectivity and and also how you manage devices like that so it is it is more than just building code that runs uh, uh, as a kernel on, on a desktop machine where the software is done by other people um, so I was warned this would happen I have lots of things to talk about but the hook is going to come out shortly and yank us off um, so anyway, we, uh, we thank you for your patience and uh, for the interest that's been shown at this conference was, was remarkable, so that's why we wanted to do this. Um, and sorry for the late change to the schedule. So please come up and see us. Uh, we're gonna stick around a little bit here. Uh, there's mail lists, IRC. Um, if you've got itches to scratch, scratch them or get treatment, depending. And, um, and thank you for your time, and I hope you win, whatever it is. Yeah.